All right, as I promised last week, we are going to be talking about the question of who is the Antichrist. Now, uh, this is kind of a tricky topic. Uh, it's a tricky topic because I'm going to talk about something in a manner that typically um, we don't view this topic in. Uh, because uh, when we start talking about Antichrist, um, most folks who are members of the Churches of Christ have what is called an amillennial view of the book of Revelation, which means that it was written for the people of the time of John. Uh, and when you're looking at it, we understand the, uh, the symbolic nature of the book of Revelation. And, uh, and so we understand that Revelation happened during that period of time uh, within the time frame of those who had received the book. So uh, the thousand-year reign mentioned in the book of Revelation is figurative. It's a figurative uh, stand-in for the time of the church and, and the persecution that the church was going to face uh, during that period of time. And so we, we don't tend to have to address this topic uh, in, in the church. Well, uh, there are some congregations that are premillennial, so there are some congregations of the Lord's Church that, uh, that follow this premillennial understanding of the book of Revelation, which I think is in error uh, myself, and I've got good reason for that. Uh, so we, we have to talk about this some to deal with that, but we also have to uh, deal with things like this. Has anybody seen this flyer come to their house in the mail? Okay, I got this the other day, and if you can't uh, read it from where you're at, it says, The Chronicles of Prophecy, a Bible prophecy seminar coming to Zachary, Louisiana, February 21st through March 14th. And it's got a whole series of lessons and uh, guest speakers and nice little graphics. And on meeting number five, Thursday, February 27th at 6.30 p.m., it is the Antichrist Agenda. That's why we have to talk about this. That's why we need to deal with this, because if this shows up on your doorstep and you don't know, you could be pulled in the wrong direction with an improper understanding of things along those lines. Uh, it could be your friends. It could be your neighbors who look at these nice, neat graphics in this slick presentation uh, and, these, uh, and these really uh, you know, well-meaning well guys and, and folks that are coming out to... Um, you know, to talk to them about, about the Bible and, and probably a pretty nice website uh, to, to go along with it and everything. Uh, and they may have a question, hey, uh, you go to church, right? What about this guy? Uh, hey, you, you, uh, you want to come with me? Well, we need to understand why or why not. And that's one lesson out of a bunch of them. I think there's some, uh, some 17 lessons um, for, from this particular seminar uh, one of them just happens to deal with this, and uh, the rest of them deal with the uh, premillennial understanding or the premillennial interpretation of the book of Revelation. So we're going to talk about one of these items uh, tonight, and that is Antichrist, or who is the Antichrist. Now, a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. Uh, this is one of the, this idea of Antichrist, uh, of course, we're still talking about Second John, right? Uh, and so uh, the Antichrist or Antichrist is, is mentioned in both 1st and 2nd John and only a couple of times. And, and uh, spoiler, John is the only one who mentions it and it's never mentioned anywhere in the book of Revelation. So that's, that's a problem for premillennial doctrine. Uh, but one of the biggest points of premillennial pre doctrine is the idea that there will be a man rise to power. Uh, this particular person is fighting against the church. He is, uh, he is persecuting the church. Uh, and he is uh, imbued with all of the power of evil, and he is called the, capital A, Antichrist. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a proper name given to a person of this role. And by strict definition, Antichrist means one who is against, a, against Christ or an opposition, uh, opposition Christ, uh, a, a messiah of the opposition, if you will, a rival Christ or one who is uh, a second Christ, if you will, uh, in that case, but uh, Antichrist uh, is literally in Greek the word anti stuck in front of the word Christ. So one who is against Christ, uh, the opposite of Christ, is really technically uh, what that means uh, from, from the Greek language. Uh, the word is used only by the Apostle John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and verse 22, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, and as we talked about last week, 2 John uh, some people sign 2 John chapter 1, uh, but it's 2 John verse 7. So uh, we see that it's used here, 
and only here. If you uh, pull out uh, the Google or if you pull out uh, an online Bible uh, and, you, uh, and you look up Antichrist, it will only appear in these four places. And so uh, it's never used in some of these other locations. It's never used in the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, Matthew, um, uh, Revelation, any of these other places where people look for end-time prophecy uh, to support a premillennial doctrine. So uh, just that's kind of where we're headed with this. So we need to come to a proper understanding. Uh, the name uh, Antichrist has been applied to uh, other mentions in the scriptures. Uh, I, sometimes we're talking about specific people who are mentioned. Other times we're talking about uh, an official capacity uh, in, in some cases. And so uh, this, this Antichrist is, is tossed around and is attributed to some of these other places. Uh, so it has been applied, and we're not going to take the time to read all of these passages. If you want my notes from this, I will be more than happy to send them to you. Um, I'm probably uh, going to put this sermon online, and, I'll, and I may try to coordinate the slideshow with, uh, with the lesson, uh, and I'll be editing this little aside out when I do so. <laughs> but uh, we'll try to keep the notes with the lesson uh, if we put this one online. So um, we're not going to take the time to read each one of these passages, but I will cite them. Uh, so the name Antichrist has been applied to the little horn of the king of fierce countenance from Daniel uh, chapter 7, verse 20 through 24, again in verse 5, and then chapter 8, verses 23 through 25. That is a mention of the four kingdoms, uh, uh, prophecies that, and visions that Daniel has. Uh, and so you see uh, as these uh, prophecies go on, um, the horns are representing power. The power is fragmented. One, uh, one a point of power rises above the rest of them. Uh, even though the horn is small, it's very powerful, it's very loud, it's very boastful. And so those, uh, some folks who follow a premillennial doctrine believe that this is uh, an antichrist or the antichrist in the course of premillennial prophecy. Uh, it's also been applied, uh, the name antichrist has also been applied to the false Christs spoken of by our Lord in Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, verse 23, and again in verse 24. When Jesus is speaking of the end times, he refers to the false Christ or false prophets that will rise at the end times. Uh, and so some folks attribute uh, this idea of a false Christ to being the Antichrist, uh, capital A, uh, the official title of a person who opposes Jesus. Uh, we also see in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, verse 4, and then again in verses 8 through 10, one who is described as a man of sin, or in some translations, a son of perdition. Um, uh, so depending on your translation, you may have a different, uh, a different rendering of this particular verse. Uh, so this man of sin is described by Paul in 2 Thessalonians, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one who is overtaken by sin, and so uh, the one who is overtaken by sin, someone has attributed that uh, as the Antichrist as well. So again, they believe in that particular passage, Paul is referring to the end times and this specific person who is attempting to overcome Christ or overcome the church. And of course, uh, we always, uh, when we're talking premillennial doctrine, we always end up going back to the book of Revelation uh, when we are examining this and the name Antichrist is also attributed to the beast from the sea uh, in Revelation uh, 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, and then uh, in, a, in a longer discourse in chapter 17, verses 1 through 18. Now that point is argued a little bit. Some folks will say that uh, that, that is not the Antichrist, but the individual who is given power by the beast from the sea is the one who is the Antichrist, not that particular beast. So there's sometimes a little bit of, of a distinction made depending on which branch of uh, dispensational premillennialism uh, that, you, that you look at. So these doctrines have very specific names, and you can, see, uh, you can see the distinctions if you really start digging into it. And as a matter of fact, in our uh, Chronicles of Prophecy here, uh, this idea of Antichrist agenda is, of course, the idea that that specific world leader who is fighting against the church has a specific agenda, a Satan-inspired agenda that, they are, that that individual is going to pursue. Uh, and so this idea of Antichrist here is personif literally personified and given agency, meaning that they are going about doing 
uh, doing Satan's bidding, if you will, in the end times of, uh, of the age of man. So, uh, that being said, we do want to move on and we want to examine these. Now, this is not a completely exhaustive list. These are the first four, or the big four, that, that really come up when you start talking about Antichrist. Uh, but what we see here, again, this idea that the Antichrist is one of these biggest points, all of these passages have other explanations do, that do not fit the premillennial view of the Antichrist. Uh, and so there are other explanations. And so, logically speaking, and, and uh, linguistically speaking, and contextually speaking, you have to overcome the idea that uh, all of these different books, all of these different writings across the time uh, of the biblical writings from, uh, from Daniel you know, in, the in the 6th and 700th century uh, B.C. all the way through uh, the, the, book, the end of the book of Revelation written about uh, 95 A.D., uh, that they're all referring to the same person because the contexts are so different and the specific name, Antichrist, is not mentioned in any other place but First and Second John. And so uh, you have to say, okay, these biblical writers completely jump contexts, uh, so this Antichrist that John is talking about writing to a local congregation in Second John is, is talking about the empire-wide persecution that's being mentioned in the book of Revelation. And, and you can't do that if there are reasonable explanations for who these other people are or what these other passages are referring to. And so there are other explanations that fit with this idea of who this Antichrist uh, person really is and what these other passages really mean. So let's look at a couple of them that we've mentioned here. Uh, verse, uh, first, Daniel chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, and then 8, 23 through 25. Um, this little horn, there are a lot of theories uh, uh, who this individual was. One of the biggest theories uh, is that this is the Pope of Rome. Uh, this is the Pope. This is, uh, you know, this is something that was written by a fellow by the name of Charles Spurgeon. Uh, if you don't know who Charles Spurgeon is, he was uh, a very, uh, very significant anti-papist. He, he was uh, thought that the, that the Roman Catholic Church was the worst thing that ever happened to the world uh, and that it was completely and totally of the devil. And so he, would, he called basically the Pope Antichrist. Uh, so um, uh, there is, uh, there's a lot of people who put uh, different people in this particular passage as the little horn. Uh, but there's an easier explanation, okay? Uh, Daniel is prophesying concerning those four kingdoms, starting with Babylon, Babylon being kingdom number one. Remember, this was Nebuchadnezzar. It would go Babylon, the Medo-Persians, uh, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. The Romans were the fourth particular kingdom here. So the fourth kingdom in Daniel 7 is the Roman Empire, not the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Roman Empire preceded the Roman Catholic Church by a couple of hundred years, uh, give or take about, about 400 years before firm establishment of the Roman Catholic Church. So the horns of Daniel chapter 7, and again, it's kind of uh, awkward to talk about this without having to go through and read all the passages, but we'd be here until midnight and Eutychus would fall out the window. Um, and so we see here that the horns refer to specific rulers within the empire, but to name them specifically is speculation. I've gone in and I've seen a lot of people try to say, okay, there are ten horns and one split and two come up here and, and this one grows separately from the rest of them. And so you start counting emperors and, and you run into trouble because some people will count Julius Caesar as an emperor, but he wasn't really. And then they'll start with Augustus, but Augustus was a pretty good guy, so we're not counting him. And, and man, you end up in all kinds of problems. Uh, how many were legitimate, how many were you know, usurpers, and so on and so forth. So it, it gets deep, deep, deep into speculation if you start trying to count off each one of the emperors uh, by each one of the horns. It doesn't make any sense, and it gets scattered pretty quickly. Uh, however, many of the emperors, in fact, did seek to deify themselves. And so there were plenty who were trying to take the glory of God on for themselves. It's kind of like uh, Aaron at the, at the bottom of Mount Sinai when they made the, uh, the, uh, the golden calf, he said, look, this is your God. Well, the emperors were saying, look, I am your God, uh, which, of course, causes a lot of conflict with the God of heaven. Uh, we even see Herod Agrippa, when he uh, receives praise as God, he knew he shouldn't have, 
uh, and then he is in fact eaten by worms. And so we see this is nothing new, uh, and so the emperors did this a lot during that fourth empire. Uh, this man would have also been in power before the church was founded. So we see here that we've got uh, a lot of things that get really tricky when you try to make this, uh, this horn a future, a far future leader uh, within, the fourth, uh, within the fourth empire when that fourth empire seek to, uh, ceased to exist in the six or seven hundreds AD, depending on how you count out uh, the invasion of Rome. So all indications point to, in fact, a early Roman emperor, not some future antichrist that seeks to persecute the church. Uh, folks also will call uh, the false Christ of Matthew 24, the Antichrist, capital A Antichrist. Now there is a tremendous break in the discussion uh, when we're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 24. Verses 4 through 28 refer to the destruction of Jerusalem which happened in AD 70. The Romans came, uh, Trajan and Titus came and leveled most of Jerusalem. There were a few uh, spots that were still left standing. I think Denise even got to see, did you get to see the Wailing Wall? Uh, that was one of the things that was left standing by the, by the Romans from AD 70, and that's because it, it helped prevent erosion from the rest of the hill when the rains did come. Uh, and so verses 4 through 28 refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. Verse 29 through 31 refer to the second coming. Uh, so we have a break in thought, we have a break in understanding of this particular passage. Now verse 5 also tells us that many shall come claiming to be Christ. If you look, you will notice that that statement comes well before the break in the thought. So we're talking about something current with Christ versus something future with the church. And so that's what we see here in this particular passage. And of course, verses 4 through 14 talk about many false Christs will come, not just one. So if you have the Antichrist, that would be a singular Antichrist, and that's not mentioned. Okay, so many false Christs would come, and not just one specific person, and they would come before the destruction of Jerusalem. We read about that in verses 15 through verse 28. And so Jesus is trying to tell the people, do not follow them. They are going to lead you astray. And if you read all the way through uh, the books of the New Testament, you have a lot of people who are already challenging who Christ was and the leadership of Christ, and as well as start reading some of the external documents around that time, you will see a lot of folks that were already usurping the title of Christ long before, long before the destruction of Jerusalem. We also see in, uh, we also see that verse 23 and 24 are exhortations not to follow these many false Christs or prophets. And so Jesus was talking to his contemporaries. He was talking to people in Jerusalem there, not a far off 2,000 years away church uh, that, that came after. Though the principle remains the same, don't follow those who would try to, to, try to defraud you of your salvation, but these were warnings for the people of that day and time. All right. Uh, the next one, the man of sin from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 10. This one is actually quite vague from what Paul is saying here. And so with vagueness uh, comes a, an information vacuum, and with an information vacuum, people start filling in the blanks however they see fit. So you run into a lot of trouble. Uh, verse 4 tells us that this man, uh, this man opposes God, claims to be God, and sits in the temple of God. Now, were this written, uh, say, from the point of view of Daniel or somebody around that time, there are lots of foreign invaders who would have fit this bill. You even have some rulers of Judea who would fit this bill. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, Herod Agrippa, uh, who, who tried to do that. Uh, this is important, though. How We only have a partial picture here. If you go back and you read that chapter, you find out very quickly that Paul had already talked to them about this question. And so that's kind of us walking up halfway through a conversation uh, and somebody, you know, and trying to figure out what, uh, what question started the original conversation. We don't know the full scope of the discussion that Paul had had with them. We don't know uh, what he had said to them before. We don't know exactly what the question was. We just don't know. And so we have a little bit of an information gap there on exactly 
what got this conversation started. Again, people will rush in and they'll fill in the blank because you see a man of sin, well, obviously a man who is of sin is fighting against Christ, therefore he must be antichrist. Okay, uh, fair enough, but is he the antichrist? Well, we, we don't have that information. Uh, Paul had uh, said to them, however, in verse 7, that this mystery that he was referring to was already working. I would definitely encourage you to go and read this passage all the way through. In verse 7, it was already working. Paul wrote uh, 2 Thessalonians probably in the mid-50s, maybe 56, 57 A.D. Um, that's a far cry from 2020. Okay, So we're, we're looking at 1970 years out, uh, 1960, 1970 years out from this, and Paul says it's already in the works. It's already working, this is already going on, this is already happening. This one who would try to usurp and who would try to take, a, take the place of God. There are two reasonable interpretations of this that uh, keep us away from the premillennial understanding. Uh, first of all, this may be a metaphor of good versus evil. Um, some folks, I, I've talked to some folks before, and they've told me, the book of Revelation is literal. Okay? Okay, they believe it, and, and so I'm, I'm going to have a reasonable conversation with you. And I said, okay, so you're telling me that there are going to be flying horses with the faces of men on them, flying over the earth. Serious question. They said, well, no. What that is was John's best description of something like a, an attack helicopter. That's a metaphor. That's not literal. If you're describing it the best you can and you put it in terms that somebody else would understand and it's not descriptive of, hey, this is a, mach this is a terrifying machine that flies by itself. The Romans knew what machines were. They had siege engines. They had all sorts of, of, of war-making uh, implements. They, they understood what a machine was. You still end up with trouble unless you're going to have flying horses with the faces of men on them, and scorpion tails, and things along those lines. And so, metaphor was something that was already used heavily in the first century. Remember, the classic Greek writings had come even before the Bible was written. And so, metaphors were used heavily. People understood what metaphors were. Uh, what did Jesus mean when he said, don't get the speck out of your brother's eye when you have what? A log. A construction beam is what he's really talking about in your own. It's a metaphor. It's a hyperbole. Okay, So this could be a metaphor of good versus evil because the battle of good, and, good versus evil has been going on for a very long time, since the beginning of time. So it could be a metaphor. Or two, it could be another reference to a Roman emperor. And remember, one kills Paul. If church tradition holds true, one killed Paul a little bit after this about 10 or 12 years after this. Beheaded him. Didn't crucify him because he was a Roman citizen, so he's killed quick instead of slow. Probably Nero. So we see this idea here of the emperors trying to uh, take the place of the gods, the Roman gods and the true god of the Bible. And so it's entirely possible that this man of sin is one who wants to, to excuse me, take upon himself the mantle of deity. So, again, we see this particular interpretation here. And finally, we go to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, uh, and then chapter 17, this beast, or uh, if not the beast specifically, then the one uh, to whom the beast gives his power and gives his authority. Again, lots of details. We could jump into the weeds of this and spend lesson upon lesson upon lesson on this, but just a kind of a quick reference here. The first thing that we see is that the beast represents power and authority, and it makes war with the saints and overcomes them. And so uh, this beast is a fierce creature. We see that from the beasts of the book of Daniel. Uh, we also see that from the statue, from the uh, image of Nebuchadnezzar, from the book of Daniel as well. So we see this, uh, these animals or these uh, images representing imperial power, typically. Uh, very rarely do these images represent individual power, but in fact they would represent imperial power. And so this uh, beast overcomes the saints. Uh, this beast blasphemes God and performs false signs and false wonders. Um, 
That goes on in just about every false religion, so there's nothing specific here that we need to single out. There's nothing outstanding about this. We see this all the way from the, uh, from the, magician, the magicians in Pharaoh's court. Remember, uh, the ones that threw the stick down uh, and it turned into a snake, and the ones that turned the water into blood. Uh, now, of course, Moses, you know, the miracles of God overcame those, but they were still able to do the magic tricks all the way through the, uh, the false prophets and the, and the false preachers and the magicians and the soothsayers and, and all of those, all the way through biblical history, we see those. And so this is nothing, nothing unusual for that day and time, and, and it's nothing that requires uh, a, future, um, a future false uh, god. Now, of course, we also see that the dragon, uh, now we do have a direct understanding of who the dragon is from Revelation. John says that dragon, the dragon, that old serpent, Satan. So I love it when the Bible uh, interprets itself. It makes my life a whole lot easier, right? So uh, we understand that the, that the dragon of Revelation is that old serpent, Satan. That is who gives this beast from the sea uh, or the individual imbued with that power, his power originally. We also see here in verse, seven, in verse 14 of chapter 17, ultimately uh, he will be defeated by Christ. And so we understand from the book of Revelation that the victory always belongs to God. Now, there is also one problem with trying to say this beast uh, and followers are the Antichrist, uh, and especially if you have a premillennial view on Revelation that comes way into the future. The big problem is, with the future setting of Revelation, how does this help the first century church in Asia Minor? John tells them these things must shortly come to pass. Uh, if shortly come to pass means... Uh, you know, 1900, 2000 years in the future, uh, that's a very odd definition from human terms of shortly. So this is something that would have needed to have happened at that time during their lifetimes. Uh, and if history serves us correctly, it happened within, depending on which emperor we're talking about here, it happened within 20 years or within 60 years. Uh, so it would have happened within one or two generations, depending on if you're talking about uh, Domitian, uh, persecuting the church or Diocletian uh, persecuting the church. They, have, they happen within about 50 years of one another. So we see this problem with this future understanding of Revelation and the expectation of a specific person to be the future Antichrist. So, who really is the Antichrist? Who is it? Okay, big question, good question. Antichrist, the answer is very simple and I am afraid that is way too simple for some folks to understand. Not because it's too complicated, but because they want it to be fantastic. Uh, remember, I remember not too long ago, uh, we had a baptism. And, and after the baptism, uh, and I think it was Collins, if I remember correctly, after a baptism came up out of the water, and, and, and we looked at each other, and he said, and I, I, he said to me, that's it. <laughs> and I said, it seems like it ought to be more complicated, doesn't it? <laughs> And he said, yeah, I, I said, but that's it. That's what God wants us to do. The answer, uh, that, that's just too simple for some folks. They want more. They want, they want more action, I guess. Well, some folks just want more action. Antichrist is anyone who opposes Christ. Anyone at all who opposes Christ, his true nature, or his intended purpose. That's Antichrist. John says many antichrists have already gone before us in 1 John. Many antichrists have already gone before us. Never once ever is antichrist used in the, book of, in the book of 1 John or 2 John as a proper type name. It's always used as a descriptive term. Okay, It's always used as a descriptive term. Uh, a good example, kind of like in baseball, you say a pinch hitter. Okay. Who is that talking about? Well, there are several people it could be talking about. It's describing what that person does. And so Antichrist describes who, uh, who we are talking about here. It doesn't name them specifically. But in the first century at the time John was writing, there was a group of people out there who were involving themselves in the creation of a philosophy called Gnosticism. You'll hear that mentioned a lot if you start studying the Bible and you start studying biblical history. And a lot of those people would come up with theories like Jesus wasn't divine. Jesus didn't come in the flesh. He was just a ghost. Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. Jesus was just a spirit. 
Jesus was not what the Bible describes Jesus as, and so they were denying his divinity. They were denying his purpose. They were denying his nature. And those people, John says, are deceiving you, and they are anti-Christ. That's it. So I talked for just shy of 30 minutes <laughs> to come to this conclusion. It's one who opposes Christ. However, there are plenty of people in this world who want to ascribe that moniker to a specific individual for a future event. And oddly enough, that future event, when it comes to pass, gives us a second chance at salvation, which the Bible does not give. The Bible tells us that we have one opportunity. It is appointed once for man to die, and then the judgment, the Hebrew writer tells us. And so we need to make certain that we, in the lives that we live, are not anti-Christ, but the fact that we hold firm to him, to his name, to his nature, and that we align ourselves with his intended purpose. The lesson is yours tonight. If you are here and you have any spiritual need, if you need to be baptized in order to have your sins washed away, or if you need to repent as an erring child of God, know that you have an opportunity to do so tonight. If you have any need, won't you come and let that need be made known as we stand and sing our invitation song. Father, at this time we 
give you thanks now for this emblem, this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood that was freely shed for us, the blood that washes our sins away and makes us pure. Again, Father, we pray that as these partake of this emblem, that they examine their lives and that they partake of this in a worthy manner. All these things we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember all those that were mentioned today that are in need of our prayers. Uh, certainly look forward to seeing everyone Wednesday night at 6 30 for midweek Bible study. Let's stand together and I'm going to ask Daniel if he would, if he'd lead us in our dismissal prayer. God, have you please?